When you compare the DNA sequence of a banana with the DNA sequence of a human being, there are thousands of homologous sequences, sequences that are so similar that they had to have been in the common ancestor who lived about 1.5 billion years ago. Before that, for 2 billion years, bananas and Homo sapiens were identical. Here is an important question. What can life on Earth tell us about life elsewhere? If on Earth there are multiple independent examples of biological evolution arriving at the same or similar features, then those features become good candidates for being features of life on other planets. So, multiple independent examples of biological evolution arriving at the same or similar features, that's called convergence. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So why is the idea of, in, of convergence so important for the question, are we alone? Well, imagine there's lineage one and there's lineage two, and these independent lineages evolve and converge on the same feature. For example, that feature could be canines here, or eyeballs, or wings, or big brains. If that's the case, then we astrobiologists have a new tool to help us describe life elsewhere. If it happened many times on Earth independently, it will probably happen elsewhere. That's the idea. So if selection pressures on, another, on other planets are similar to the selection pressures on Earth, Darwinian natural selection will produce life forms similar to the life forms on Earth. Now, let's ask two evolutionary biologists what they think about this idea. And they think completely opposite things. But let's ask them the question, if we could replay the tape of life, what would happen? Compared with the, today, the results would be, well, Stephen Jay Gould would say the results would be very different. There would be no humanoids. Simon Conway Morris says they would be very similar. Yes, humanoids. So what are we to make of this? Even two evolutionary biologists can't agree about a very important evolutionary biological question that we need to know the answer to if we're going to evaluate whether we can use convergence to help us guesstimate aliens. Stephen Jay Gould says the most important thing is contingency and deep homology, randomness, quirkiness. Simon says convergence is everywhere. Now, Stephen Jay Gould was an interesting guy. He said, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. About the word contingency, this is, this is a paragraph that he wrote that kind of represents the, the, the meaning of the word contingency. We are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. Now, in 1989, Stephen Jay Gould wrote this book, Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. And in it, he praised a scientist who studied the Burgess Shale in depth, and that scientist was Simon Conway Morris. Gould praises Simon Conway, Conway Marsh, and you can see how uh, pleased he is with the praise. <laughs> We interviewed Simon Conway Morris, an evolutionary biologist, and he wrote this book in 2003, kind of in answer to uh, Gould's book. And the name of this book is Life Solution, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. This is kind of the Bible of convergence. But I want to draw your attention. Simon Conway Morris is a very paradoxical, very funny guy. And he wrote, this is the subtitle, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. I bought this book, I said, what in the world does that subtitle mean? 
And uh, it took me quite a while to figure out. Inevitable humans in a lonely universe, what does that mean? <coughs> or as some people say, what does that even mean? <laughs> well, it's not that hard. It took me a long time to figure this out, but it's not that hard. If the origin of life is rare, then we will be in a lonely universe. There, weren't, there won't be that many life forms. However, if once life gets started, humans are inevitable, then that's why they're, it's called inevitable humans in a lonely universe. How can that be the case? Convergent evolution. He thinks humans are inevitable if life got started because the selection pressure for human-like intelligence is universal, according to Simon. Now, let's talk about some things here a little bit as an introduction to the types of evolution we can talk, have. Let's suppose that this x-axis is genetic, functional, or phenotypic distance. So this is distance. And this is time. And there are several ways of evolving. This is called divergent evolution of species A and B from a common ancestor. This is called parallel evolution. And this is called convergent evolution. Notice that all three modes require divergence in this bar here. See, they have to separate. They have to separate. You cannot converge unless you have previously diverged. Now, any two species, A and B, will always have a common ancestor somewhere. So therefore, there is no such thing as completely unrelated species, although you will read this phrase many, many times in the silly biological literature. It's like pre-Darwinian statement. Also, before the common ancestor, A equals B. They were identical. They were the same thing. There's no difference before the common ancestor between A and B. Also, we can say that there's, you know, you can have divergent evolution. One diverges a little bit more than the other. You can have parallel evolution that kind of goes that way. Or you can have divergent evolution, convergent evolution, like that. Now, as an example of convergence, uh, this is uh, placental and marsupial mammals converging on the same form, according to Dawkins. So if you have placental mammals like a dog, a mole, a flying squirrel, and a saber tooth, there are marsupial equivalents, or very similar things. Thylacinus apparently looks like a dog. Notorices, I don't know how to pronounce it. Rotorices is like a mole. Petaurus is a flying squirrel, and saber tooths are like this. I think these are maybe all extinct, but in any case, they were marsupial mammals who looked amazingly like these placental mammals. Now, there's a problem with this type of reasoning, and the problem is this. Here is the origin of life four billion years ago, three billion, two billion, one billion, and here are placentals, and here are marsupials, and they diverged about 160 million years ago. They diverged a little bit, and we are to imagine that this convergence, this convergence is completely independent of all of this. So we have four billion years of identity, then they diverge a little bit, and then they converge. After four billion years of identity, they converge independently on similar forms. That's what the, this convergence implies. So Dawkins also has written, it has been estimated that the eye has evolved independently between 40 and 60 times around the animal kingdom. And he goes on and on and says, it seems that life, at least on this planet, is almost indiscreetly eager to evolve eyes. We can confidently predict that a statistical sample of Kaufman reruns, that means the rerun of evolution on other planets or on Earth, would culminate in eyes, and not just eyes, but compound eyes like those of an insect, a prawn or a trilobite, etc., etc., different kinds of eyes. Now, if they evolved independently, why are they all in the tiny animal kingdom, Richard? So to remind you, here is life without viruses. Here's Luca, here's bacteria. Here are the eukaryotes. And eukaryotes are a small part of the tree. Animals are a small part of eukaryotes. So let's look at the eukaryotes. Here are all the eukaryotes. And where are the animals? Right there. There's a small part, a tiny part. And he's claiming that the, the, anim, the independent 40 to 60 independent examples of animals evolving eyes is independent in this tiny, tiny, phylogenetic, closely related group of critters. So to summarize what we're meant to believe, here we have 4 billion years of identity and 
placentals in mammals diverged, common ancestor 160 million years ago. Over here we have animals with the common ancestor about 700 million years ago. They diverged, and then we have A1 and A2. This is now. We have 3.3 billion years of identity. And after 3.3 billion years of identity, they converge independently on eyes in this tiny fraction of the phylogenetic tree. The common ancestor had many of the genetic ingredients or pre-adaptation for the eyes that evolve. That's what I would suggest. And let's, so I would call that deep homology, not remarkable independent convergence. So what does independence mean? Now, as a physicist, we have a definition of independence that means, hey, when you roll the dice, they're independent of previous rolls. Interestingly, if you read the biological literature, that's not the case. In physics, each roll is independent of the previous one. In biology, definition of independence is like this. You have common ancestor, and then they diverge. Once they've diverged, then we say it's independent. So no matter how recent the common ancestor is, and no matter how many billions of years of shared identity before divergence, all evolution is supposedly independent of species that have diverged. Now, that seems crazy to me, but you know, I think biologists have just never heard of loaded dice. Now, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. Stephen Jay Gould wrote a book about hen's teeth and horse's toes. And in it, he wrote, the genetic systems are integrated products of an organism's history. And they retain extensive latent capacities that can often be released by small changes. Atavisms are things like that. In other words, a common ancestor can also have these latent cap capacities, which, when expressed later in two distinctly related descendants, distantly related descendants, is best understood as deep homology rather than remarkable convergence. So, as an example, consider the phylogeny of amphibians, you know, frogs, and uh, salamanders. Now, here is the phylogenetic tree, of, here's mostly frogs, and here's some salamanders. And here's the loss of mandibular teeth. And notice that frogs don't have mandibular teeth. And here's where it was lost. And all of these, the blue, their teeth are absent. But here they have teeth. And right here is an example of what they call the re-evolution of mandibular teeth. Now, this is the supposedly independent convergent evolution or re-evolution of mandibular teeth in amphibians. However, the loss of expression of the genes responsible for mandibular teeth does not mean that the genes are absent. So I'll bet dollars to donuts that this is not a re-evolution, but depends very much on the same genes, the same pathways, particularly the early pathways to form teeth that are in here. So homology means similarity due to shared ancestry. So for example, let's consider homologous bones. Human, cat, whale, and bat. The humerus, the radius, the ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, they're all, they're all homologous. That means they had a common ancestor that already had these divisions of bones. Here's some more humans, dogs. Here's a bird, for example. The same thing, homologous parts of the forelimb we're talking about here, the arm. Now, when we say wings evolved n times independently, well, look at this. Does that look independent of that and independent of that? No, they're not independent. They're homologous. They're always the forearms, and they're waving, and they have the same bones inside of them. I would not call that independent, although the functionality to make them fly is a new thing, but the pre-adaptations and the things that are necessary to do that are all there because of shared ancestry, because of homology. Here, for example, here's a, a whale, and here's a penguin. Penguin is a bird. Are these water wings? Have they learned to fly independently? No, I said they're using the same homologous forelimbs to do it, whatever they're doing. Now, just to get a little bit more technical, Stephen Jay Gould, before he died, wrote a very big book, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory. And on page 1059 out of 1433, you will see this diagram. And I wanted to talk a bit, little bit about that. So we asked the question, what factors determine the direction of biological evolution? 
And you can crudely divide them into historical factors, or functional factors, or structural factors. So for example, now this question is important for our guesstimates of what life elsewhere is like. For example, if the universal structural factors of physics and chemistry are the primary cause of the directions of evolution, while historical and functional factors are minor, then life elsewhere will be similar to life on Earth. An example of a structural factor would be the similarity in the longitudinal streamlined body shapes of dolphins and fish, for example. They have to move through water, and that, uh, those are structural constraints that you will find anywhere if you want to move through water. If, on the other hand, weird and random historical factors are the primary cause, while functional and structural factors are minor, then life elsewhere will be very different from the life on Earth. So for example, let's suppose that the primary cause of evolutionary, what drives evolution is structural. These structural constraints are dominant and universal. Therefore, we expect similar life forms elsewhere. So here's a minor constraint, minor constraint. Here's the dominant constraint, the primary cause. On the other hand, let's suppose historical factors are the primary thing. Quirky history, deep homology is dominant. Therefore, we do not expect similar life forms elsewhere because they will not have the same history. History is quirky. On the other hand, you could say, and Simon Conway Morris makes this argument, that the functional constraints, the selection pressures, if they are similar, that will lead to similar things on Earth and elsewhere. But you could very well argue, I think, that the, that the, that the, uh, the selection pressures depend so much on the quirky histories of the things around you that you, it's not a good argument that the functional pressures will be the same, I think. So, in conclusion, there is no life form on Earth as unrelated to us as life forms elsewhere will be. Among the life forms on Earth, we do not have the degree of independence needed for convergence to make useful predictions about life elsewhere. That's my view. It's a little bit pessimistic. Simon Conway Morris would argue vehemently with this view, but that's the nature of science. Maybe the universe is filled with extraterrestrial aliens, but none of them will be as closely related to us as bananas are. Hmm. But don't tell Hollywood. Imagine how boring movies would be without moving animals, without sexy vertebrate aliens, without threatening bilaterally symmetric aliens. <laughs> <laughs>